موسیقی I happen to be Shahzad Hassan Khan and we hope and pray that everybody out there is doing wonderfully well and that you're ready to kickstart your day with us. But first things first, hello Haja, how are you doing on a fine sunny Thursday morning over here in Islamabad? Assalamu alaikum, thank you so much for introducing me Shahzad, so I'm doing really wonderful and thank you so much for introducing me once again. Shahzad, so I've noticed this thing in Islamabad that it's not very foggy or smoggy nowadays because I do remember last year it was very smoggy. I don't know if government has done something to curb that menace of smog because Lahore is really, uh, I mean, disturbed by that phenomena, right? And it has to be dubbed as the fifth season nowadays. I, I think, you know, when we kind of look at the AQI, which is the air quality index, last time when I was in Lahore, I did my research on it, it was beyond hazardous. Right. So it was somewhere around 497 and it might have risen in the past few days as well. Right. So imagine that, um, you know, day in, day out, if that's the kind of air you're going to breathe in, what will it do to you and the future generations of the country? Right. So the Punjab government uh, comprehensively decided that they're going to keep the schools shut right. uh, for True. three days in a week. And that those three days are, by the way, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, <laughs> I guess. So, you know, I think that we really need to take those measures and need, need to be kind of considerate and talk about clean energy. We do quite a lot over here. Hmm. But away in Islamabad, obviously, the smoke issue is not very prevalent, True. but obviously it's the fog and we tend to enjoy it, you and, know. And Having a cup of coffee on a foggy night, you know, alongside your best friends, I think that's something which I'm looking forward to doing in this December. I think foggy in nights can be enjoyed, but smoggy can't be definitely True. because it affects your health when you say that. And also... But one way or the other, it looks the same though. <laughs> you know, whether it's smog yeah. or whether it's fog. Yeah. You can, if you feel like enjoying it, you can. But, you know, with smog, ladies and gentlemen, it no, is you can kind of injurious. you if that's smog because it, I think something is stuck in your throat and you can feel that it's smog yeah. because that is, you know... The irritation. Really quite, yeah, yeah, the irritation fact. Uh, and I think the way the uh, cities are expanding and uh, urbanization is going on, this is a very uh, pressing menace that needs to be tackled, true, right? True. Because the population, they are migrating from the... Uh, rural areas to the urban areas and I think the planning is needed and as I love this thing about Islamabad is that it's a very well planned city right exactly. as compared to other metropolitan cities in exactly. Pakistan. Exactly but Hajar you know what what actually makes me think quite a lot or wonder quite a lot is that you know that Pakistan is not even such an industrialist country true. where we're like okay there's so much of pollution I think it's more, more true. usually that's true. the uh, transport uh, uh, which we are using e day in day out and you know obviously people outside this country actually have these protocols where you really need to pass those examinations for your vehicles as well. For example, Euro 5, Euro 6. And if you do not fulfill the requirement, mm -hmm. you cannot still keep the car going onto the road as well. Well, that's a different and a separate subject. But ladies and gentlemen, I think it's about time that we get started with the show. There are four things I wanted to uh, share with each and every one of you. And uh, so it's by Hazrat Ali, alayhi salam, ladies and gentlemen. And he says that, you know, whenever you are alone, control your thoughts. Whenever okay. you're going somewhere, control your eyes. Whenever you're offering your prayers, Make sure that you control your heart and whenever you are with company, make sure that you control your tongue. And I think I like it. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for sharing these words of wisdom because they're wonderful. And I do feel, especially when you talk about controlling your gaze, it's very much important, especially in the public spaces. And this is kind of the grooming that Islam has imparted on us. But, but I think that we are some, somehow forgetting that and we are losing touch uh, uh, with our traditional roots sort of that. And that is why I do feel that there are a lot of problems that are rising.
Welcome back. So today we are going to talk on a very interesting topic. It's regarding women empowerment and women entrepreneurship and how to make sure that the women, especially in Pakistan, are there on the right track when it comes to their business choices. So we are very glad that we have been joined by a guest who happens to be Dr. Naveed Iftikhar. He is the co-founder of The Weekend. Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for coming to our show. Thank you for inviting. Alhamdulillah. So joining Dr. Naveed, we have Ms. Laiba Ahmad. She is CEO and the co-founder of Weekend. Assalamu alaikum, Laiba, and thank you so much for coming to our show. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having us. Wa alaikum assalam. It's wonderful to have you guys over here. So first of all, you know, we want to give this information away ladies and gentlemen just on this weekend please make sure that you take our time because the weekend festival will be taking place at pnca from 12 p.m till 10 at night and Wonderful. what's going to happen is that women from all parts of pakistan 100 entrepreneurial women you know who are very enterprising in their lives will be coming down over here and exhibiting whatever they've been handcrafting for all of us so i think it's uh, our right. responsibility to make sure that we go out take our time, take our kids, they, they will have food courts, they will have open mics. And you know, so I think it's going to be an interesting sort of an event where sure. anybody is more than welcome. Please come and show your support for all of those entrepreneurs out there. Now let's get the conversation started. Okay, so VCAM, so tell us about how did you come to this entire concept? And obviously we know that the women, there's a lot of barriers when it comes to starting their entrepreneurship. Some of them are very constructual, uh, sorry, the, the conservative constraints out there. So please tell us about your idea. So VCAM is a women entrepreneurs camp. And uh, what we've been uh, thinking and observing that how women face many challenges when they have to participate in the labor force. And we see that's why the labor force ratio of women is one fourth of men's participation in the labor force. And the reason is they face many challenges. And um, I, I will only mention two challenges. One is mobility constraints. We don't have very good public transport system in our country. And if you have a good car, then you know the world is open for you. But if you don't have a good car and you know a driver, then there are a lot of challenges for women to travel. And the second is obviously the cultural constraints that we often don't allow women to go out, work in offices. And uh, so that's the reason that we started WeCam. And what we wanted to do that inspire millions of women to start businesses. And recently digital technology has enabled them. They can work from home. So WeCam is an initiative to support and celebrate home-based women entrepreneurs. Wonderful. So we do three things actually. First, we have an e-marketplace that is WeCamp.pk. Uh, all of the products which are displayed on this platform are developed by women who are working from home. Second thing what we do that we organize regularly WeCamp festivals. And these festivals are actually organized to celebrate and support women entrepreneurs in a way that they don't get many opportunities to go out, to rent a space, to work in uh, you know, shopping malls. So we provide them this space for two days that we are going to uh, have this festival on 10th and 11th of December in PNCA. So 100 women will come there. So what we do that we invite then people of uh, Rawalpindi and Islamabad to visit this place. So the women learn from each other. They make new customers as well. So that's the second thing. The third thing that we do at WeCamp is we provide trainings to these women. All right. So how can they accelerate? How can they start their business? So this is an initiative actually to empower women to start their own businesses and then inspire millions of other young girls and women that they can you know, get a motivation from these women. So that's why we invite people with their families. They should come with their children so that they see that how women are doing entrepreneurship. Wow, and it's, and it's wonderful. And uh, I believe that, you know, I'm going to actually pledge and urge people out there to please make sure that you take our time, come over there. The tickets only 100 rupees, you know, just to kind of make sure that, you know, that you're serious people out there, you know, are looking for some good artwork, looking for some good sure. hand handicrafts and supporting people. I think that intent needs to be there. But let's move on to the co-founder as well. So, Ms. Laiba, I mean, it's interesting to see how you've co-founded WeCamp. But, you know, sir over here mentioned that, you know, we try to inspire women mm -hmm. who are at their places, you know, to do whatever they want to do. How do you do that? What is that exercise of inspiring people out there to make sure that they start to earn by themselves? Right. So, for women, unfortunately, as compared to men, they're not enough entrepreneurial abilities and women in Pakistan are also kind of socially taught to be afraid okay. of taking risks of taking business risks so what we do at WeCamp first of all is we build a community 
uh, women entrepreneurs okay. who are doing similar stuff so they know that there are women like us out there who are mm -hmm. also doing this. We aren't alone in this journey. We can learn from each other and we can lean on each other. Mm -hmm. uh, through our workshops, we not only build on hard skills like financial management, you know, how to sell on an e-commerce platform, but also how to have confidence in your product and in your ability as an entrepreneur, as a businesswoman. And the festival is a great platform to do this because at the festival, the women are there, they're behind their stall, they have their product in hand. True. So there's the confidence of selling your product face to face to another customer. I think it's it's wonderful and the idea is, um, is, is very conceptual and if somebody's going to get it, obviously they'll be hooked to it as well. So will you take your wife along? Yes, yeah, so why not? I mean, why not? I mean, right. if, we do, if I do get time, I will certainly go because Wonderful. the test match will be taking place in Multan. Okay. Okay. But even if I do not get that chance, I think my wife herself will go. <laughs> so that, that's not a problem. But Wonderful. what I wanted to ask you over here was that, you know, right at the beginning of the introduction, mm. I said that, you know, that there will be 100 women from different parts mm. of the country. So how do you collaborate with all of them and what regions, uh, women from different walks of life will be joining us? So mm -hmm. what regions, provinces will they be joining mm -hmm. us? And what are we in for? You know, what sort of clothes or bags or jewelry are we going to get? Or khussas or <laughs> junia or, you know, whatever. I, I don't know how it works. Please. Right. So we have women coming from Islamabad and Rabalpindi, but okay. not just this. We have women coming in from KPK. We have collaborated with the SEED program and through them we are bringing in 20 women from KPK. These are women we've okay. provided trainings to as well. And they're from Noshera, Haripur, Peshawar, all areas of KP, Galyat as well, wow. showcasing those traditions. Um, at the festival you'll find all sort of handmade goods from fashion and accessories, home decor, arts and crafts, organic skin care, oils. There'll be an open food court with women-owned ventures selling home-based cooking, traditional foods as well. At this opportunity, I'd like to just show you guys sure. my bag. Yeah. So this is also made by one of our women entrepreneurs. This is a reusable jute bag. Wow. And this pay, there's handy, there's hand-woven sunflowers that she has shown over here. So you'll find many such products like this, a few that are, you know, a bit more modern, a few that harken back to traditional crafts as well. Wonderful. So I want to come back to Dr. Saab over here. So Dr. Saab, now there's one more problem with uh, with us and that is that we certainly, whenever we're spending money, we kind of need to take a good look at what value is it going mm -hmm. to offer us. Now imagine that VCAM, I think it's a greater platform out there for people, you know, who certainly want to do something in their lives and we're glad that you are out there for them. But how do you uh, kind of place their brands into the minds of the people over here so that the value of money, uh, you know, they, they kind of feel like rubbing it in th into their faces as well at times. So how do you brand those products? Because making products is one step. I think the next step is that how you brand it. So how do you work on that and how do you collaborate? So we have this uh, platform wecamp.pk on which all products are made by women. So what we do actually, we regularly, uh, you know, help these women to brand their products. Okay. So we also do personal branding workshop, product branding workshops with them. You know, the kind of bag, uh, uh, you know, that Laiba was uh, showing to you that when she, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, reviews their products, she gives them feedback as well. Okay. So even on this bag, she has given them feedback that how to improve it further. Right. So that's one part where we try to improve their products. Second part is actually we tell people that how important it is to buy products from women entrepreneurs. Because what we see that everywhere you go into the shops, markets, I often tell that you go to jewelry bazaars True. and jewelry is, you know, worn by women, but you'll see that every trader and every jeweler is a man. So what we need to do is actually, you know, this is something that we want to revolutionize that how women come, can come forward. So there will be women who are actually designing jewelry, who are making jewelry, uh, uh, you know, at home. So I think this is what where we do the branding that you are actually not only buying the product, you are actually supporting a family. There are many women actually, they are independently actually making living for themselves and for their family. So what you are doing actually, you are not only buying a product, you are supporting a family to get education, to get health. So that's why we encourage people that they should go on wecamp.pk, they should visit this festival on this uh, weekend and they should really support and encourage these women. And sometimes these women don't get often feedback. So what we encourage our customers, if you have not liked the product, if you think that there is something that needs uh, improvement, then you can get back to us, you can get back to that entrepreneur and you can tell them this is how you can improve your product. 
So this is where our role comes in. We provide you know, fashion designers, we provide expert input to these women and then we actually uh, collaborate with media platforms, we collaborate with digital marketing and influencers and we ask them, we request them to support us in this cause. So Laiva, coming back to you, we have seen Shazad that there is a glass ceiling especially in the corporate mm -hmm. world and especially in the western corporate world because women cannot rise to from a particular point, right? And mm -hmm. also there are a lot of cultural barriers here in Pakistan because um, the spaces, public spaces are sometimes not deemed safe for women to step out. But I think technology is changing that equation a lot because a lot of women can out, uh, come out on the social media and they can sell their products from there. So what is your outreach strategy to especially those sort of women who are facing cultural barriers, especially in a lot of not so very posh areas mm. of Pakistan? So sadly, we acknowledge that women in Pakistan, like we've all talked about, have mobility constraints and also accessibility constraints. But with the Wi-Fi, with internet today, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to access networks, mm. knowledge, marketplaces from the safety and comfort of your own home. So we offer these, for these women uh, entrepreneurs, uh, our e-commerce platform, we take care of all the logistics for them, we take care of all the courier services. <laughs> so from the comfort of their own home, they can work on their craft and they can operate a business. Wow. But beyond this, we camp and our parent company, Atom Camp, we are also expanding away from just um, handicrafts to you know offering skills like content writing, software development. We have a data science boot camp that's in progress with special um, scholarships for women so that you're not just expanding as a woman, uh, you're not just shattering the glass ceiling with handicrafts mm -hmm. but also other skills as well. So Dr. Saab, coming back to you, we've seen, I want to explore the concept of the third men or the third party, especially in such kind of ventures because we've seen a lot of time. Middle the third, party. Yeah, the middle person, he's exploiting, he or she's exploiting the mm -hmm. poor artisan who are actually delivering. Commission it. Right. Right. Commission right. So what we are doing actually, so this is the main purpose of establishing We Camp. What has been happening, you know, women have, have been doing, you know, this artwork, craft work, you may be hearing that women do it in Swat, in Bahawalpur, in many other parts of the country. So, but they sell it to the middle persons. They get the, you know, the batar, a shawl from them with like 300 rupees and then they come to F6 True. of Islamabad. They sell, you know, it's 5,000, 6,000. So, what we've done actually, so this platform, they can uh, set the price of their product themselves, whatever price they want to charge. Mm -hmm. So, there is no middle person. So all what we do that we charge 10% you know commission mm -hmm. on their price uh, on the sale price and that's all mm -hmm. and uh, then customer has to pay you know this courier charges and this is how they can directly you know ask for the price that they need to you know charge for this and the second thing I just want to highlight you know because we've been discussing this festival that's right. happening in PNCA. Right. There are so many activities happening for children on this festival. Go ahead, please. Let us and uh, so for children, what we've arranged, actually, we've arranged uh, quizzes on uh, cosmology. Oh, and wonderful. there will be prizes. We'll ask them a few questions about stars and solar systems and cosmos. So they'll get excited. And uh, the second thing what we've done, actually, we have planned, uh, you know, scavenger hunt. Mm -hmm. And there will be clues for the treasure that they'll find in the festival. Adults can also participate, that's the second activity. The third activity that we've planned actually, there is, um, there is an author, Pakistani. She has written a book for children. Uh, her name is Sonia Rahman, her book's name is Wolfie. And she'll be uh, doing a book launch and she'll be signing uh, books wow. for children. Wonderful. So we also have a play area for children. So that's why we are encouraging people to come to PNCA. This is open for public and they can come on uh, 10th and 11th of December. They can enjoy with their children and they can support women entrepreneurs. And we do have open mic over there as well. We so have open mic there. Yeah. You know, thank you for reminding so us. If you want to sing your heart out, please make sure that you do that very quickly towards the end. Laiba, one last thing and that is that, you know, so we obviously are going to witness this festival over in Islamabad at PNCA. Do you guys plan, does VCAM plan taking it beyond uh, Rahul Pindi and Islamabad, somewhere in Lahore, Karachi, elsewhere, or probably outside Pakistan mm -hmm. as well? Mm -hmm. So I'm Lahore based, so I would love to bring the Weekend Festival to Lahore and I am planning to do a Basenth Festival for oh, women wonderful. in March and slowly slowly we are going to start doing festivals across Pakistan as well. I hope they allow us this time around to uh, <laughs> celebrate Basanth as well. Right. Well thank you very much for being thank with you. us, thank lovely to so be in much. conversation with you for everybody who's out there. Ladies and gentlemen, you reach at this point in your life when only you've had that nurturing, nourishment, support system with which mm -hmm. you have attained a level of success. 
and that is only possible right after some quality education. What do we do about education is something we want to talk about in the next segment. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you very much for staying tuned to PTV World. For uh, anybody and everybody who just tuned in, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in. You're watching World this morning. I happen to be Shazad Asan Khan and with me, I'm lucky to have been joined by my wonderful colleague who happens to be Ms. Hajra Sati. Right, heading out towards a short break, we spoke about the importance of education. And today, we're going to get a very religious perspective of education and then you know, obviously, there's been an increasing trend when I was going to my university right. that people were applying to UK, US, True. and, you know, elsewhere in universities to kind of have a better career right after their graduation, post-graduation. So right. uh, we really need to strike that balance in between whether we should be opting for foreign universities, True. whether is it going to be any good for us, or what does our religion tell us about education? So without any further ado, we're very lucky that we've actually been joined with somebody uh, who happens to be one of our favorites too as well, ladies and gentlemen. He happens to be your Sajjada Nasheen of Mohra Sharif. He is Mushtaba Gul Bacha Sahib. Hello sir, Assalamu Alaikum. How are you? Wa Alaikum Assalam. I am fine. Thank you for inviting me. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. You are one of the most amazing religious scholars. We have always been in conversation. So wonderful to have you over here. Not just that. Today we have been joined by somebody who's who's actually on, on a very positive note, is, is an advocate of uh, getting education from foreign universities. But that's what the debate is today. Why foreign universities in the first place? So what he does is that he gets students from Africa, elsewhere in different regions, send them to Canada, Australia, UK, you know, so that anybody can have that equal opportunity of better future. Ladies and gentlemen, we're lucky that we've been joined by Mr. Muhammad Asif, happens to be AJ, AKA AJ, and he happens to be an education expert. Hello, Assalamu Alaikum. Good morning. How are you, brother? Wa Alaikum Salaam. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much for joining us. Wonderful to have you. So, sir, aap se, you know, I would want to start and obviously, so we've heard this, ilm hasil karo chahe tumhe cheen tak jana pade. So, what does our religion, Islam, tells us about getting education? In Islam, if we analyze that the first Quranic ayat, that is Ikra. also based on education True. knowledge, Ikra bismi rabbi ka lazi falak. Then the second important incident, the first battle, battle of Badr, those prisoners who were kept captive, hmm. They were given chance to set free if they are going to educate Muslim students. So I think that the importance of education is in Islam. It is one of the most important component. Rasulullah sallallahu said, seek knowledge from cradle to grave. True. Whether it's a man or a woman, knowledge is and seeking education is obligatory for everyone. True. As a Muslim. As, As a, a Muslim. Muslim. So, Asif, moving on to you, we would like you to explore. So, like Shazad mentioned, there's a trend of a lot of people who want to go abroad for their higher education or studies. But and in a lot of times, what I felt is that some of people have went back to Pakistan. Why? Because there's a lot of global uh, inflation out there. So, they're not able to manage between the expenses and between the boarding and obviously the tuition fee. How do you suggest one would approach their homework, especially when selecting universities for abroad? Uh, there are actually two things. One of the main major part, I think so, is that uh, before making any decision, uh, there is an uh, important thing is that the course you're choosing. Uh, a lot of students have seen that, you know, their parents are giving them suggestions that, you know, be a doctor, be an engineer. Mm -hmm. But uh, technically, the student wants to study something like music, something like, you know, in uh, business or maybe in something uh, related to uh, artificial just intelligence. Just degree. That's exactly. It. So uh, this is the first part where the student is lacking their self-confidence. And then when, you know, uh, imagine, I mean, they, they reach to the university, uh, 
they start studying, but the main, you know, focus is that, you know, still the dream is towards the... Uh, Bahar jana, exactly. Lekin wo wahan pe jo courses, I mean the main thing is the courses which they are taking yeah. is different. Uh, in, in like, you know, UK, US, Australia, the main thing is that you have diversity in courses. That, uh, you know, you, uh, if you're studying engineering, you can uh, simultaneously, you can take uh, music classes, yeah. you can take uh, business classes, arts. So you can carry forward with the two uh, major, like, you know, uh, it, like the paths. So, uh, uh, Mujtaba Saab, coming back to you, we have seen that in Islam, Islam had a very vibrant culture when it comes to education. And we have seen that there's a guy, an Arabic guy, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, he uh, created the entire algebra because your inheritance laws are so much difficult. And it is said about them that if you learn them, it means that you have learned half of the education. And a and lot of uh, Islamic scholars, their research can be tr uh, rooted back to the Quran, right? So where are we standing nowadays in terms of education? Uh, naturally, nowadays we are lacking. And before, uh, uh, like m if we are going to move back 500 years or 1,000 years, Muslim scientists, they were the founders of the all, all the of subjects, subjects. Yes. All the subjects. True. Even now uh, in Euro European countries, they are like they are talk, uh, told that they are the father of medicine, True. is yeah, the Muslim yeah. si uh, scientist, and the father of the uh, mathematics algebra. is also algebra, it's also a Muslim scientist. But I think now we are not, uh, our coastline and our, uh, like Asif was saying, that now uh, hamara jo wo ek aim hai, that's only to have a degree. True. True. That's not to learn or acquire knowledge. True. 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 And, and in connection to that, you know, let's let's move back to Asif over here. So Asif, how do we decide? I mean, would you recommend for children out there who are actually watching us today that it is going to be very fruitful for them to go and study abroad? Because what I've seen is that I've been to UK myself and I've met my friends over there who actually mm -hmm. went to study. And people over here back home even think that they're studying at a great university where it's just a two bedroom house and they've named it a university and they do not even go to attend, work on odd jobs and then towards the end of four or five years they do not even have a permanent residence, no degree, coming back home to Pakistan <coughs> and then that's the time when their parents really take a go on them. That hey you know what you wasted all our energy and money. So how would you recommend that parents keep a check on students too as well and how do we kind of qualify for all of those other universities who actually kind of promise us future prospects? Uh, this is a very good question actually. Yeah, good. Before making any decision, before you know selecting a university, you need to do a lot of research. Uh, I've seen in like past four or five days that people who are buying land in Pakistan, mm -hmm. they're doing a, actually a lot of research. So when you're investing a huge amount of money on your land, because you know it's going to pay you back. So education is, I think, so much like you know, uh, precious than a land. True. Because it's not I'm only teaching you, it's teaching your generation, the future generation. You can be a good, you know, like a, a good son, good uh, husband, good father. So it's, it's about teaching your generations. I would recommend students who are like watching us right now that before making any decisions, before going to the uh, consultancies, uh, do your research, do your part. That either this university is going to give me what I am actually looking for. Uh, it's not about the permanent residency all the time. It's about your knowledge because if you have the knowledge, countries will give you permanent residences. Ooh. And I must say that I've seen a lot of my friends who are actually graduated from, you know, uh, need to be more capable. prestigious universities. Yes. They're actually studying, uh, working right now in Pakistan awesome. with a good, you know, like handsome yeah. amount of salary. So you need to do a lot of research. And then, you know, uh, after that, you can search about those consultants. Uh, just go to the university website, find the international page. You can find the uh, trust, uh, trusted uh, agencies mm -hmm. and, you know, further you can proceed over there. So how can people get in touch with you? Because, you know, obviously you, are, you being over here means that, you know, you are a trustable gentleman where people can come and you can definitely counsel them, give them a piece of advice. How can people get in touch with you? It's my uh, LinkedIn, actually, most of the time and Instagram page. But I would rather promote myself. I would say that uh, we have a platform. Uh, which is called Adventus, okay. and it's giving, uh, uh, you can say that job creations to those who are actually knowledgeable, awesome. that they have knowledge on uh, getting students, recruiting students, uh, but they don't have the contracts with the universities. It's not easy to get the contracts from the British universities True. or Australian universities or uh, US universities. So what they can do is like they can be a part of the uh, Adventus group. Uh, it's an online platform. Even you can, you know, like go 
through the platform you can see that you know a lot of things are there six years and ago i decided i'm done with my <laughs> education so the only thing i want to learn is on the morning there is no limit on that. My there is no limit on the yeah, education yeah, <laughs> no but in addition to that now what i wanted to ask was that it's it's good that you know people can come over there they can join us yeah. and it's wonderful but i've seen in multiple occasions what happens is that you know the, these universities which are not big universities i mean it's just a business <coughs> towards the end of the day it's a business model what they do is that they find business representatives in different countries so one of my friend happens to be a business rep for a university which okay. is based in england okay. and what he does is that he gets this target of inducting 50 or 100 students almost every year so how does that justify that you're actually going to send somebody to to a good university when you're already right. representing a university you've been on their salary base mm -hmm. as well and so how do we kind of clear, clarify for ourselves that whether you know going to send us to a university you are in contract with okay so basically uh, i would answer to the first part that obviously these are the public funded universities and uh, they have to one as well so they have targets how to get students uh, i must say that you know after the covid universities are like you know they have enough of the students they don't need you know the anymore. education consultants yeah. anymore uh, i would i would suggest that uh, the universities over there in uk like you know you mentioned about some of them uh ek ghar ke andar sir ek ghar ke andar university bani hai yeah but i mean this is this, this is the thing like you have to do your research True. i mean if you have no um, if you haven't done the research properly and you haven't done see i'll tell you like in pakistan i'm i must say that uh, after every like you know second home there is one person who is studying abroad or who is based in uk yeah. and those people who are actually based in uh, those particular countries like uk us australia they name themselves as the counselors which is not the true story because they haven't done the re research they don't have the knowledge they just you know say that you know uh, uh, i've seen that in pakistan that you know um, we have those like uh, people who just say that um, we will get you the visa on the done basis yeah. just pay us this much amount and we'll get you the visa please be careful from those people uh, because you know universities will end of the day they will pay the commission to the consultancies true, true, true. so it's better like you know just and very quickly one more thing you know just for the audiences who are out there as well because this is something which i have realized that any individual can do over here in pakistan so obviously my younger brother was studying at oxford university wonderful now my cousin is studying at oxford university Mashallah. but it's all online so imagine he's in pakistan he couldn't travel because of covid so the mm -hmm. entire course is online so why go abroad and have uh, to pay some extra cost for your living and True. traveling and what not when you can do the online course and the degree will be by oxford anyways I can just relate myself as in that you know I I was having Do you think it's a better idea? Uh I can come to that. Like uh when I was uh, you know like planning to study abroad I couldn't do that due to like um uh, some like personal Issues. problems. Yeah. Like I couldn't travel but then um uh, I started working in Dubai I, I ended up working there and uh, when the covid happened so I had to do my MBA online. There is a pros and cons to everything. if you are doing online courses online degree it, it is saving your time you can work full time with your, within your company uh, but the main thing is that you're not getting the diversity you're not getting the exposure which you have to bring end of the day to your company to your family to your country i know a lot of people who have studied in abroad and they actually brought that particular knowledge in the country and we can see that you know uh, uh, anywhere you go no, but that diversity comes in i'm sorry uh, but because i have actually taken a very closer look at it so imagine what he does is though he's doing this uh, masters program right. and you know it's an executive masters program and you know the other people who actually within the in his group someone a, is somewhat around 55 years of age someone is 60 years of age and the, what they do is that they very smartly put you in those groups where you really need to work together have the ideas you know have have that communication in between and then submit the projects together as well which brings in that diversity which brings in that culture which brings in that mind of frame frame of mind as well why well, i think having said that you know it's for the people to kind of judge it better right. but yeah i want to move back to mustafa sahab over here as well mustafa bhai when we talk about how our religion has always been very vocal about education yet now these days we do not get a lot of muslim scholars into a lot of research and development what's the problem over here i think the main problem is our syllabus either we have to study islam or we have to study the modern education we are not uh, uh, combining both educations okay. it it was before uh, 600 years back 700 years back so 
this is the main factor. Because usually what we do is ji, wo ye usme yehi likha tha ji. Haan ji. You know, so it, it it has been stated in this book. But so you know, we really need to be just by that. You know, so we, there's no research, there's no comprehension to it, there's no better understanding to it. So if you know there was somebody 600 years ago and he's written it in the book. We are still going by the book. You know, when are we going I to kind of? I think there is a lot of literature, and it's in the Arabic, especially because Muslim has done so much advanced work, and the questions that are now being posed in this modern societies, they were addressed back then. Yeah. But the problem is that we are a non-Arabic speaking uh, societies, that's and we our, can't. Then that's our mistake, no? That's, that's true, our that's mistake. True. I think we need to translate them. Or rather, we should learn Arabic. The best method is because there is lot of much. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Right. So, uh, how can we address this gap between the non-Arabic speaking societies and accessing the literature, the Islamic literature, which is so much abundant and there in the Arabic society? I have heard uh, now uh, in schools from class one, they are going to teach Quran and they are going to teach Arabic language. So yes. this will right. help us it to address be. Quran and to see Quran in depth. Like and obviously, you know, it, it actually, uh, for example, if you're reading an Urdu book, yeah, just like we read Iqbal's poetry, you know, mm -hmm. we are able to understand it. Imagine mm -hmm. that, you know, that you know the language and then, you know, you read our holy book. I think there'll be better understanding. And when True. we speak about Quran, ladies and gentlemen, it gives you a lesson from every walk of life. May it True. be science, may it be religion, may it be society. I think it talks about everything. But thank you very much, sir, for being with us. Thank you very much, AJ, for being with us. It was lovely to be in conversation with you. We yeah. put a information out towards the end of the day ladies and gentlemen it's for the people who consume that information to testify it whether it's authentic or not so it's your responsibility never blame anybody else True. do your own homework do your own research and then jump whenever you feel like and I think the beauty of Quran is that every time that you read it you find something new and something very inspiring and something deeply moving so until next time it's a goodbye and good morning, good morning. thank you <laughs>